Hello, pre-cal MA 110, and welcome to your final exam study guide resource. You can use this resource to get yourself ready for your final exam that we will be taking during week 16. If you would like to see a copy of this study guide, you can print it in week 16. All you have to do is just go upload it and you'll have a copy. It does have the answers attached. So the answers are on there um, when you print it. Okay, let's get started. Number one wants us to find the distance between two points. Distance between two points. Hopefully on your cheat sheet, you have the formula for distance. Here it is in case you need it. X2 minus X1 squared plus Y squared minus Y1 squared. They gave us two points, negative three and one, also negative six and negative three. If I label those, if you want me to label them, I've got X1, Y1, and I have X2, Y2. And if I throw these into the formula, I have the following. Okay, here is the numbers posted into the formula. Next step is to simplify. Simplify what I can. Underneath the radical, negative 6 minus negative 3 is negative 3, and that's still squared, plus negative 4, and that's also squared. That simplifies again to 9 plus 16. 9 plus 16 is 25, and the square root of 25 is 5. Final answer. Okay, next they want us to find the midpoint. Your midpoint formula, x1 plus x2 divided by 2 will give you the x value, and then y1 plus y2 over 2 will give you the y value. You can separate these with commas and put them in parentheses. This becomes an ordered pair. And I have my points 7, 1, x1, y1, and I have negative 16, negative 16, and that is x2, y2. Okay, fill in the formula. Next step, fill in the formula. You'll see in red where I filled in the numbers for the formula. And then if I simplify this, I get negative 9 over 2, comma, negative 15 over 2. And that gives me my two answers for finding the midpoint. My x is negative 9 over 2, and my y is negative 15 over 2. Number three, it asks us, it gives us an equation, 9x squared plus y squared equals 9. And it wants to know, is this equation symmetric to the x-axis, y-axis, and or origin? It could be um, one, or it could be all three, or it could be no. What they want you to do if it's, I'm going to give you guys some information here that you should have on your cheat sheet. If it's symmetric to the x-axis, we're going to replace 
y with negative y. If it's symmetric to the x, y axis, we're going to replace x with negative x. And then if it's symmetric to the origin, we're going to replace both. So one at a time, let's do x-axis first. I'm going to replace the y with negative y. Simplify, and you'll see, you will now see that it is equal to what we started with. And so therefore, yes, this is symmetric to the y -ax x-axis. Let's do y-axis and see. This one says to replace the x with negative x. And you'll see when we simplify that, yes, we end up with what we started with. So it is also symmetric to the y-axis. And then last, is it? symmetric to the origin. This time I'm going to check both of them. And you will notice that it is also symmetric to the origin. So we have three answers here. It's letter D, symmetric to the x-axis, y-axis, and origin. Okay, number four is asking about the graph that you see. It wants to know a couple things about the graph. It wants to know the domain, also the range. Is there any x-intercepts? And is there any symmetry? Okay, domain. When I'm coming in from the um, x value, you see it goes right up close to that zero line, but doesn't touch it. So it basically starts at zero and goes all the way to infinity. It doesn't touch the zero, so it's only greater than zero. Looks to me like all the values are greater than zero. If I look at my range on the y-axis, this graph keeps going up top and also kept going down bottom. So therefore, it is all real numbers, the entire number line, all real numbers. Where do I see it crossing the x-axis? Right here at this point, which is 0, 1. And is there any symmetry? If I flip this graph around the x or around the y or around the origin, will it end up giving me a perfect mirror image? The answer is no. So this one is none. There is no symmetry just by looking at that. Okay, number five, same questions. What is the domain? What's the range? Um, what are the x-intercepts? Are there any y-intercepts? And does this graph have any symmetry? All right, let's keep going. Domain, if I come in on the x axis, I start seeing this at negative 2, and it goes all the way to infinity. So x will be greater than or equal to negative 2. On the range, I start seeing it at 0. And then it goes all the way up top. This part of the graph keeps going. So that gives us positive infinity. 
So all the values of y are greater than or equal to 0. Do I have any x-intercepts? I see two of them. I see one at negative 2, 0, also at 2, 0. Are there any intercepts on the y-axis? I see a point on 0, positive 2. And does this show any symmetry? If I flip this graph around the x or y axis or the origin, would it give me a mirror image? A mirror image? The answer is no. This is none. No symmetry. Number six and number seven is asking us, is this graph even, odd, or neither. It can't be more than one. It's either got to be even, odd, or neither. If you look back in your notes, if I put in negative x for x and I get the same thing what that I started with, same thing that I started with, then therefore the equation is going to be even. Okay, let's say that I put in negative x and all signs change. Everything on the whole problem, the signs change, then that will be odd. Now, if it's not even, if it's not odd, then therefore the answer is neither. Okay, let's start with number six. f of x is equal to x to the fourth minus x squared. I'm going to put in negative f of x, which gives me negative x to the fourth minus negative x to the second. This is going to give me x to the fourth minus x to the second. And that is what I started with. That's the same thing that I started with, x to the fourth minus x to the seventh. So therefore, number six is even. Okay, number seven. What happens if I put in f of negative x into this equation? 3x cubed minus 2. If I decide to put in negative x, I'll have 3 negative x cubed minus 2, which simplifies to negative 3x cubed minus 2. Now, keep in mind, the first one changed. I started with positive 3x cubed, and I changed to negative 3x cubed. But I also started with negative 2, and I stayed at negative 2. So it didn't really change all the signs. It only changed one of the signs. So since it didn't change all the signs, this one is going to be neither. It's got to change every side before you can count it odd. Okay, number eight is asking me, what is happening on the interval? What's happening on the interval? between zero and three. Between zero and three is right here. And it looks to me like that is a straight line. If we have a straight line, then you call that constant. From zero to three, it is constant because it's going in a straight line. Look at your x values. Between 0 and 3, it's going straight. So therefore, it is a constant. Okay, number 9. What is happening between negative 5 halves and 0? Well, negative 5 halves is 2 and a half. Negative 2 and a half, sorry. So if I look, that's going to start right here. 
and it's going to end on zero. So if you look at your graph, what is happening between those two points? I get this from the problem. It tells me between five halves and zero, what is happening? To me, it looks like it's going up. This graph is going up. Look at the line. It's going up, up. And so, therefore, we are increasing. Okay, number 10 has the graph of y equals x squared. That's a parabola. A parabola is to the x squared. And we want to shift this six units up. Now, if I want to shift it up, that means that I'm going to put it on the outside. Up means plus six. And this one would be D because I have my X squared and I've raised it up six to make that parabola go up. Our parent graph is at zero, zero. And what this one is asking to do is just move this whole thing up six. Number 11, take the square root X function and shift it three units to the right. Okay, let's think about what we learned. If I shift to the right, I'm going to use minus. If I shift to the left, I'm going to use plus. And so this one wants us, and we're going to put this on the inside, not on the outside. And so therefore, if I want to shift three units to the right, that means I minus the three on the inside, on the inside. So final answer would be D. Number 12, the graph of Y equals X squared, which is your parabola. Y equals X squared is a parabola that's at zero, zero. And they want you to vertically stretch this by a factor of nine. So if I take this graph and vertically make it uh, longer, I guess, it's going to be something like this. It's going to be really, really skinny. Would be on your blue line. And what I do for vertical stretches is I have to have a number on the outside. That takes A's out. That's not on the outside. Um, B is out. That's not on the outside. It's actually in both. But the difference in C and D, is the 9 positive or if it's negative? If this graph was negative, it will be upside down. So therefore, my answer is C. Y is equal to 9X squared. Because if I chose D, then that graph will be upside down and your bowl will be facing to the bottom. And so therefore, it is answer C with the 9 being positive. Okay, let's first start with number 13. Find a function that is graphed after we do the following transformations. First of all, my graph is y equals square root of x. Y equals, this is number 13. Y equals square root of x. That is the one that starts at 0, 0, and it looks like somebody's throwing a football it, it like they're arching it out it's going to go up first and then it's going to come back down all right then it wants us to shift that graph down seven okay down seven means minus seven on my outside on the outside so right now, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the graph is down here. 
And then it wants us to reflect it on the X axis. Reflect it on the X axis. If you reflect something, reflect on the X axis. That means I'm going to have to put a minus in front of it. Okay, if I reflect it on the X, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then up here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If I reflect it on the X, it's now, I mean, it was down here. If I reflect it on the X, it's going to now be up here. And then the last part says to shift it left six points. There, That is done on the inside underneath the radical. So I still have my negative on the outside. If I'm moving left, that means to do plus six. And all this is inside the, the um, radical sign. And then on the outside, I have a minus seven. So final answer for number 13 would be B. Okay, number 14. Number 14 says that we have the absolute value graph. Absolute value graph. Which is the V. They want us to shift this down six units. Down six. So therefore, I'm going to have to take this and put down six on the outside, negative six. Next thing, they want us to reflect it. Reflect on the x-axis. That means that I have a negative in front. And then they finally want us to shift it left seven. If I put it left seven, that's going to be on the inside. And if I move it left, that means that I'm going to plus. And then I still have the minus six on the outside. So therefore, you have your final answer right here. Okay, number 15. It says to find a function that is finally graphed after the following transformations have been applied. Number 15 is also an absolute value graph. So it looks like a V, but we're going to be moving it around. And let's see what they want us to do. The first thing they want us to do is take that graph and move it right three places. So therefore, inside, I have x minus 3. And that moves it three places to the right. Okay, next they want us to stretch it by a factor of three. So that means I've got to put a three on the outside. All right. Next, it says to shift down two units. Down two. If I do that, I'm going to have a minus two on the outside. That tells me to go down. And then 15 ask us to um, reflect it on the x-axis. If I reflect it on the x-axis, that means that I'm going to have to put a minus sign out here. Okay. When we reflect it, we have negative 3 onto the x minus 3. And we still have the negative two that's on the outside. This will be your final answer for number 15, which is B. B would be the final answer. Okay, number 16. Number 16 wants us 
to take two functions and we're going to add them together. You see where it has the plus F plus G, F plus G, 4 minus 4X. And I'm going to add that to negative 9X plus 4. Final answer. What you need to do here is add your like terms. So if I add my like terms together, I will end up with negative 13x uh, plus 8. I put my 4x and negative 9x together, and I also put my 4 together with my 4, and I got negative 13x plus 8, which is answer B. Number number 17. Number 17 asks us to subtract the two functions. So I start with my first function, 3x minus 3. And then I subtract my 9x minus 6. If you remember, when we're subtracting, we change that sign to a plus and then change the signs of everything after the plus. And then from there, you can use adding functions formula, which I could put my 3x and negative 9x together, which means I have negative 6x. And then I can also put my negative 3 and 6 together, and I have plus 3 which looks to me like we are doing D. This answer would be D. Okay, number 18 is asking us to multiply. Remember what your rules are. They got F times G. My F is 2X plus 5. My G is 4X uh, minus 4, and I'm going to use FOIL. For F, I've got 8X squared. O, I've got negative 8X. I, I've got positive 20X. And then my L on FOIL, I have minus 20. You'll notice that your O and your I can combine together. So you'll be left with 8x squared plus 12x minus 20. Okay, number 19 is asking us to divide. It says f on top, that's 4x plus 1. And it tells me g on bottom, 3x minus 5. And that is um, c. Okay, number 20 is when we're starting to learn about logarithmics and exponential forms. Don't forget about the conversion rule. If you can convert these things back and forth, it'll make it a whole lot easier for you to um, figure out what the answer is. Um, what they want you to do in 20 is to convert this to a log, convert it to a log. So my I have log, my base is 2, to the 1 fourth is equal to negative 2, which is A. We get A, but just think about take the base to the outside equals the exponent. 21. What is the opposite of E? The opposite of E, same thing. I'm going to do E to the 18th is equal to X, but the opposite of E is LN. That's your natural log. So you will have natural log of 18 
is equal to x, which would be our a. Number 22, same thing, change it. 3 to the negative 3 is equal to 127. 3 to the negative 3 is equal to 1 over 27. Use your back and forth rules. There, there is a formula that shows you how to change these logarithmics over to exponential. And then for 23, don't forget that the opposite of natural log is E. So I'm going to take E to the 6th power is equal to X. E to the 6th power is equal to X, which is A. The next section we have is when you're using your properties of logarithmics either multiplying rule, division rule, or power rule. And they want you in 24 to expand it. How do I expand this? Okay, the first thing we got to do is think about division rule means subtraction. So I'm going to take log base 5 of my x cubed and subtract my six. And then don't forget, you can take the exponent and move it to the front. So you're left with three log five of x minus six log five of y. Okay, number 25 is the opposite. They've either got it subtracted or added, and they want us to put it into a single logarithmic. And so since you see that this is added, the opposite of addition is to multiply. So I will have log base C of M times N. Looks like that is C. Number 26. If I subtract them out and then add the other one, don't forget my three can come up to the top. So I'm going to do log a base A of X over Y because those are um, subtracted. And then I have my Z where I brought the power up to the top. Okay, number 27. Number 27 uses change of base formula. And that rule says take the log of Let's say I had log x of y. I would take the log of y, whatever that number is, and I would divide it by the log of x. And so therefore, this particular problem would be the log of 104 divided by the log of 2.1. You would have to put that into your calculator. I can't show you that on the screen, but if you put it in the calculator, then you should get a 6.6260. The next section, number 28 through 32, is solving logarithmics. And we'll start one of them, and then we'll go through all of them. There's different techniques of solving these things. You just got to figure out which is going to be the easiest for me to do. And I'll do, I'll show you a couple different ways. Um, number 23, 28, we have the log base three of X is equal to four. What I would do in this problem is change it to exponential. Three to the fourth 
equals x. 3 to the 4th equals x. Now you can put that in your calculator. 3 times 3 times 3 times 3. So therefore, x is equal to 81. Number 29. Log base 2 of x plus 4 is equal to 1. Same thing. I, I would do the same thing. Whatever's whatever is my base is equal to this. So 2 to the first power is equal to x plus 4. Well, if I subtract 4 from both sides, I'm going to get that x is equal to negative 2. Final answer, negative 2. Okay, number 30. I have 3 to the first power plus 2x is equal to 27. Now, the way that you solve this problem is by getting your bases the same. Like, there's no way that I can change this to an exponential, but I can get my bases the same because if you get your bases the same, then you can add your exponents together to figure out your x. So how can I change a 27 to a 3? Change this to base of 3. And if you do that, it looks like you're going to get... Um, 3 to the third. 3 to the third is equal to 27. And then the rule says, once we have our bases the same, you are permitted to take these things right here and set them equal to each other. So I've got 1 plus 2x is equal to 3. I'm going to subtract 1 from both sides. That cancels. I get 2x is equal to 2. Divide by 2 on both sides. I will have the x is equal to 1. Okay, number 31. We have 3x is equal to 1 over 9. Same thing here. Same formula. We're going to have to get our bases the same. I would try to move this to a base of 3. So you got to think about how can I change 1 ninth into a base of 3. Now you're going to know a little bit about exponent rules. Exponent rules was um, in intermediate algebra, the class you had before this class. But you realized that if I do this, to the negative 2, I would get the same thing. Look over here. 1 ninth is equal to 3, negative 2. Because that would be the same thing as putting the 3, negative 2 on the bottom. So therefore, that would give me the 1 ninth. And then the rule says, if my bases are the same, they are the same. If my bases are the same, then I want you to take your exponents and set them equal to each other. So therefore, I have x is equal to negative 2. Okay, 32 is done the same way. We're going to have to get our bases the same. So if I change that 64, I got 2 x squared minus 3 is equal to 2 to the 6th. 2 to the 6th is 64. And then the rule says, take your exponents once your bases are the same and set them equal to each other. So I have x squared minus 3 is equal to 6. Now I still got to solve for x. So what do I do? 
It looks like I got to move that three. I'm going to move the three. So then I'm left with x squared is equal to nine. So therefore, x is equal to negative three and positive three. Okay, our next thing that we're talking about is multiplicity of what is happening at the x-axis. Do we have a zero there, first of all? And then you have to figure out, does it touch the x-axis or does it cross the x-axis? Okay, let's start on number 33. 34 and 35. This is when they told us the multiples of the zeros. We know where the zeros are based off of factoring that, but what they're asking you, does it touch the x axis at that spot or does it cross the x axis? Now, when the power is even, it's going to touch and head back the other way. But if it's odd, it's going to cross. Okay, so let's look at number 33. On my x plus 4, x plus 4, I have a multiple at negative 4. That gives me my 0. That's to the first power. That's to the first power. So it crosses it crosses at negative four. And then our next one, x minus six, if I set that equal to zero, I'm gonna get x equals six, and that is to an even power. So therefore it will touch. Okay, next number 34, x plus five equals zero. So I know I have me an x at negative five, x minus 2 equals 0. I also have me an x at 2. The x plus 5 was to the power of 1. So therefore, it crosses the x-axis. And then the one that says x minus 2 this is a power of three. So therefore, this one also crosses. And what I'm talking about, it's not going to ask you this on the test, but if I was to, you know, graph this, if I went back to negative five, I know that this graph is going to cross. It's going to cross over the x-axis. And then it says two. That means, I mean, it could be doing some other stuff in the middle right here. But when it gets back to two, it's going to cross again. So we know what is happening at negative five and positive two. It's going to cross the x-axis. Okay, number 35. I can see that I have an x at negative one-third to a power of four. And then I also have um, x, x squared plus four to the fifth power. This one is to the fourth power. So what is happening in this case? If it's to an even power, if I set this equal, I will get x is equal to um, one third or negative one third. And so therefore it touches, it touches because I have a power of four. Okay, what happens on this one? Since I have an odd power, it's going to touch at negative one third. However, at x squared plus four, it's going to cross.
Number 36 and 37 are asking you how many maximum turning points are there on the graph. The formula for turning points is to take N minus 1, where N is the degree. Okay, so in 36, looks like my degree is 3. That's my highest power. And so 3 minus 1 is 2. So answer D. And on 37, my degree is 6. And 6 minus 1 equals 5. And so therefore, answer C. On number 38 and 39, we're going to be using the rational zero theorem to list all the possible rational zeros for your function. So what this is giving us is what could be, I'm not saying they all are, because they're not all possibilities. All they're talking about <coughs> is what could possibly be the zero on the x-axis. And the rule tells you that we're gonna do P over Q P is your last number, and then Q is your first number. So if I listed all the possibilities of getting me a 14, I would list positive negative 1 times positive negative 14. I would also list positive and negative 2 times positive and negative 7. Okay, what am I going to get for Q? Q is 1. The 1 is in front of the x to the 5. So therefore, the only factor of 1 is 1. And if I simplify this, I've got every number over 1. So it looks like I will be getting D. D are all the possibilities of what could be a rational possible 0 for this equation. Number 39, we got P is equal to 8 and Q is equal to 2. So if I listed everything from 8, I got 1 and 8, and I've got 2 and 4. What do I have for positive 2? Only a 1 and a positive 2. And so I just start listing them all. I mean, you could end up with um, duplicates. So you're just going to cross those off. But if I listed all the duplicates, I can do positive negative one, uh, one half, uh, two, four over one gives me four. 8 over 1 gives me 8. And it looks like I got all of them. And so, therefore, your answer would be A. Number 40 and number 41 are giving you equations. And they're asking, what would the graph look like? And so I would use something like leading coefficient test to figure out if it's going up or down on the left or the right. I would also factor the equation to see where it crosses the x axis. And then you should be able to pick out your graph from A, B, C, and D. Number 40, I have f of x is equal to 4x squared minus x cubed. You know, I might want to change this around so that I have my higher degree on the bottom. I mean, on the, on the left side, which is okay. Don't forget this little, this little um, code. If my degree is odd or even, is going to tell me what my end behavior is. And then if my leading coefficient is positive, 
it's going to go down and up. If it's negative, it's going to go up and down. Over here, if it's even and both positive, they'll both go up. And if they're both negative, they'll both go down. So I would look at my leading coefficient behavior to try to figure out, you know, what might be happening and then look at my turning points and so on and so forth. So let's get a little bit of information. My degree is three. I also have, which is odd, my leading coefficient is negative one so that's negative so we already know because of that that it's going to be going up on this side on the left and down on the right um how many turning points do we have looks like two so this thing will be turning around twice and then if we tried to factor it, if I wanted to factor it to find my x-intercepts, like I don't know what is happening at the x-axis, I can pull out um, x-squared. Negative x-squared is what I would pull out. And then I would be left with x minus 4 is equal to 0. And so if I set these up, negative x negative x squared equals zero well that's zero and then x minus four equals zero that's four so we know at zero and we also know at one two three four that this thing is going to either cross or flip back up since we have x squared right here this is even even numbers mean it touches and goes back up so it will go back up it'll flip somewhere up here and then it will cross again at positive four okay number 41 we have f of x is equal to x to the fourth minus 9x squared. Same thing, I would look at your ending behavior. My degree is 4, so therefore it's even. My leading coefficient is 1, which is positive. And so what that's going to tell me, this part right here, will tell me that both sides go up both sides go up and then we want to find out how many turning points like how many times does this turn four minus one is three so you know i can't just go down to zero and turn around once because it has three turning points and then if i factored it i could factor it into x squared minus which is going to be x squared minus 9 so i have x to the second power is equal to 0 x squared minus 9 is also equal to 0 this is an even power even power so therefore at 0 it touches let's let's start drawing what we need we know it touches at zero. Let's see where else it touches. X squared equals nine. So therefore X is equal to three and X is equal to negative three. So at positive and negative three, and that's to the first power, like we know this goes up. And we know this goes up from leading coefficient test. And then we know this touches. We already did that. That touches, which means the rest of this graph is going to go down 
cross at positive and negative three. So it kind of looks like a W. We've made it through our study guide. I hope this guy, I hope this helps you with your final exam. Let's get to studying and get those grades up. Good luck to you guys.